All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good night, wherever you are. Different parts of the world. We have our distinguished speaker for today. Uh, really delighted to have uh, uh, Dr. Tatiana Polyakova from Moscow, Russia. Okay. She is the head of MADI, uh, Department of Foreign Languages, uh, in uh, since 1995. Uh, she holds a degree of candidate of pedagogical sciences, which is equivalent of PhD in methods methods of foreign language teaching in engineering education. Uh, the doctor of uh, degree of doctor of pedagog pedagogical sciences and professional education. Uh, she is the author, co-author, and editor of many national textbooks on English for specific purposes and more than 80 scientific articles on the problems of education. Tatiana Polyakova has been a member of IGIP since 1998. Uh, so it's a pleasure to, uh, to welcome her as well as our colleagues from uh, from IGIP, which is Michael Auer and Hanno Hodge. So thank you all for joining us. With that, I'm just going to hand this over to uh, Dr. Tatiana. You're on. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Krishna, for introducing me. And uh, I would like to say that really I uh, represent here Moscow Automobile and uh, Road Consta Construction State Technical University. But at the same time, I represent IGI here, International Society for Engineering Pedagogy. And I have a special honor to speak about the issues of engineering pedagogy, especially now in 2021, because uh, in September, uh, we're having the 50th uh, uh, International Conference uh, of Engineering Pedagogy in Dresden. And in a year, we're going to celebrate the 50th anniversary of EGIP. Uh, so now, uh, coming to the presentation, now you can see the title of it uh, on the screen. And uh, in my presentation, uh, I will speak about engineering pedagogy, about the Glagenfurt School of Engineering Pedagogy. I will try to describe the main challenges of engineering pedagogy at present, and I will share my ideas on the main contradiction of education 4.0. And um, if I have time, I will say a few words about engineering pedagogy terminology and the project which was launched by EGIP. So, uh, pedagogy as uh, an educational science tries to give answer to the basic questions. What for do we teach? What do we teach? Whom do we teach? How do we do it? And with the help of what do we do it? And where? And these questions are quite familiar to many people and at the first glance they may seem quite simple and uh, engineering pedagogy is uh, also an educational science and the term of engineering pedagogy uh, appeared in the 60s in the 70s uh, of the 20th century and at the beginning the term seemed maybe a little bit strange to some educators but now uh, everybody recognizes that engineering pedagogy is a science and it is being developed uh, in many countries as a branch of professional pedagogy that focuses on the issues of engineering education, including technical discipline teachers, professional development. Of course, engineering pedagogy uh, that is being developed in different countries takes into account national peculiarities and traditions of engineering education systems. For example, in Russia, engineering pedagogy uh, deals mainly with the issues of high technical education. In Austria, again, thanks to the tradition, Engineering pedagogy covers the problems uh, 
of secondary and higher technical education. Engineering pedagogy as an educational science also answers the same basic questions. So engineering pedagogy uh, identifies social demand and interprets it in terms of educational aims. It uh, researches and determines the content of engineering education. It uh, selects and works out technologies, methods, teaching aids that uh, can fit the learners, the target audience, and learning conditions, uh, that is, educational environment. And uh, having answered these questions, engineering pedagogy develops educational model for achieving the expected results and it introduces uh, the oi, 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 oi. introduces uh, the educational model into the system of uh, engineering education and uh, we can we can uh, define engineering pedagogy mission mi mission as uh, identify um, supplying scientific uh, foundation for transforming the social demand for professional engineers on the labor market into satisfying results through the system of engineering education. And engineering pedagogy. Engineering pedagogy um, just a moment. There is something. Oh. We can see your screen. That's not a problem. Uh -huh. we can see it. Okay. So um, I'm sorry. I had some problems. So uh, engineering pedagogy. So begins with identifying social demand for engineers, and uh, the social demand for engineers. Uh, of course, depends on the level of industry development. In its turn, the level of industry development is connected with technological progress in general and uh, connected with technological revolutions because they give uh, a very prompt and vital effect uh, on the economy. Now on this slide, you can see the well-known representation of four industrial revolutions. Now we call these revolutions industrial in analogy with the name of the first industrial revolution. And uh, here uh, you can see all the four revolutions and their characteristics uh, and the time they just took place. But I'm not going in detail, I would just I would like to draw your attention that I'm going to speak about the third industrial revolution and the fourth industrial revolution. The third industrial revolution uh, is closely connected to my mind with the Klagenfurt School of Engineering Pedagogy. Of course, the revolution um, just influenced industry greatly but uh, we can even consider that the third industrial revolution was one of the reasons of the appearance of the Klagenfurt School of Engineering Pedagogy. Uh, in engineering pedagogy, uh, there are just uh, a few scientific schools uh, for example, there is Dresden School of Engineering Pedagogy, but maybe the Klagenfurt School of Engineering Pedagogy is most famous 
thanks to the fact that it can't be separated from IGI. And the Klagenfurt School of Engineering Pedagogy and IGI are associated with the name of Professor Adolf Melezzini, because it was Adolf Melezzini, professor of the University of Klagenfurt, who developed the main uh, principles of the Klagenfurt School of Engineering Pedagogy. And at the bottom, you can see the titles of the most famous books written by him. It was Adolf Milicinik who initiated the foundation of International Society for Engineering Pedagogy, and uh, it, it happened in 1972 in Klagenfurt in Austria. Adolf Milicinik was IGI president for more than 30 years, and he was a life honorary president of IGI until to th until his death in 2015. So, uh, the Klagenfurt School of Engineering Pedagogy is closely connected with the Third Industrial Revolution because uh, the um, influence of the Third Industrial Revolution caused uh, a high demand for professional engineers on the labor market in many countries and secondary and higher technical education institutions began to increase the number of students. And uh, more students required more teachers. And uh, universities and colleges had to hire a lot of professional engineers for teaching in educational organizations. And of course, uh, the majority of them suffered from the lack of teaching experience. So the problem was uh, the development, professional development of technical teachers or technical discipline teachers. And uh, the Klagenfurt uh, School of Engineering Pedagogy provided definite answers to the basic questions. So uh, they determined the aim of the course as developing engineering pedagogy competences. Uh, the content uh, of the course was presented in the first EG prototype curriculum. Um, they defined the learners. Uh, they were professional engineers without teaching experience. But at the same time, it turned out uh, to some people quite unexpectedly that uh, the, the majority of professors in engineering universities do not have any pedagogical education. They chose uh, the appropriate methods of teaching. And Adolf Milicinik, being an engineer, he managed to uh, use the most advanced technical aids of that time, among them computers and video. And so the system of psychological and pedagogical development of technical teachers was developed and it was uh, implemented in the centers of engineering pedagogy. This course was compulsory for teachers of Austria, but the work was a success and uh, uh, IGIP centers of engineering pedagogy were organized later in, in many countries. Political and economic changes, um, uh, the creation of European higher education area, and first of all, the reforms of higher education systems uh, according to the Bologna Declaration, uh, including the systems of engineering education, required updating of the system of professional development of technical teachers. And uh, the second variant and the third variant of EG prototype curriculum were designed and adopted, uh, approved uh, in 2005 and in 2013. 
So we can say that the Klagenfurt School of Engineering Pedagogy so uh, was developed uh, at the period of the Third Industrial Revolution. And in this situation, engineering pedagogy managed to give definite answers to the basic questions. Now we are speaking about um, the fourth industrial revolution and the new challenges for engineering pedagogy. So the fourth industrial revolution triggers industry 4.0. And in its turn, industry 4.0 requires education 4.0 and engineering pedagogy should provide answers, uh, correct answers, in order to model and create education 4.0. But uh, the, the work with the answers to these questions uh, meets some difficulties. First of all, the changes are radical and rapid, and the educators suffer from the shortage of time. And uh, moreover, they have to act very often in the situations of uncertainty. Even if we are speaking about the fourth uh, industrial revolution, there is no consensus among the specialists whether it has begun or we are just on the threshold of it. If we are speaking about Industry 4.0, we can see radical changes in techniques and technologies, as I have already said. And these changes cause uh, changes of engineers' functions. Uh, and more than that, they appear new functions of engineers and they appear new engineering professions, and specialists say that that happens every five, year, five years. And I remember that when Professor Michael Lauer was in Moscow uh, many years ago, and um, he was the first person who began speaking about the appearance of new professions, and that that time it was it didn't sound realistic it was just something uh, which may happen in, in the far future but now we can see that these new engineering professions really appear <clears throat> and uh, uh, what should we do in order to create education 4.0 education that corresponds to industry 4.0. Of course, it is necessary to answer the first question, what for, and to begin with defining educational aims of engineering education. And uh, as usual, we begin with the analysis of the social demand, but the social demand is constantly changing we uh, go to the interpretation of the social demand, but this demand is constantly changing. And speaking about new functions of engineers and new engineering professions, we sometimes begin teaching students when they are in their first year, but the situation in five years when they graduate from the university will be quite different. And that means that maybe for the first time uh, in the history of the mankind, we have not only analyzed and interpret the social demand, but we have to forecast it. And uh, we know that uh, recollecting this famous citation it is very difficult to predict especially the future it is a very complicated process and uh, more than that we know that many forecasts never come true and uh, these uh, 
prompt changes in the educational aims, they uh, make uh, necessary to change the content of education. And we uh, include knowledge, hard skills, soft skills, competencies. We are trying to analyze uh, very attentively the professional activities of an engineer. And uh, we find new skills, new competencies, and of course, uh, this analysis, the results of this analysis, help us to develop uh, the necessary competencies of, in, of future engineers more effectively. But at the same time, we can see a conflict between limited number of contact hours and a growing number of competencies to be developed. And we find ourselves in the situation when we have to choose what to teach. And in this situation, I think uh, there is some danger to underestimate the value of knowledge. Uh, because uh, we say that knowledge is available online, and that is true. But at the same time, I think it is very important to preserve uh, some fundamental nucleus uh, connected with knowledge, because this fundamental nucleus will help uh, graduates to adapt in future to new professional situations, to make immediate decisions in extreme situations where sometimes there is no access to internet. Uh, this fundamental nucleus may help our uh, students in future to be ready for a lifelong learning. And uh, the last but not least thing, it's intuition. Uh, many psychologists say that uh, in order to generate new ideas, it is necessary to have intuition. And uh, the intuition is based on encyclopedic knowledge. So. I think it is necessary to think uh, choosing the contents of our education, uh, not to forget about fundamental nucleus. Because um, in the characters of, of the famous novel, The Mysterious Island, many years ago, uh, managed to survive uh, with the help of their knowledge they found fire, uh, food, shelter, and so on. But I have some doubt that young um, engineers, uh, modern engineers, if they find themselves on the isolated island, they would manage to survive without any access to Google. Then um, the question, whom do we teach? Learners, they are engineering students and uh, the students whom we meet in the classroom now belong to uh, so-called Generation Z or digital natives who were born in the 21st century. And uh, very often we complain that they suffer from clip mentality. At the same time, they are just um, fantastic. They have a very high speed in searching for information. Uh, they uh, have, uh, we see the so-called eight second uh, filters that <clears throat> are connected with their attention and they are some kind of protection against information explosion. They have fantastic operational memory but at the same time, they have problems with long-term memory. 
and uh, they have some difficulties with cause-effect relationship. They have uh, difficulties with analysis. Some of them have uh, some obstacles in face-to-face -face communication. But I think it's it's um, it's useless to complain. They are not bad. Uh, we are we should just realize that they are different, and uh, they differ from the previous generation, the generation Z. But uh, what is more important, there is a great difference between the generations of teachers and learners. Um, my colleague, uh, Teresa Restiva uh, from Portugal, once uh, told me with great sadness that we do not know how to teach. And I tried to persuade her that we do know, we know how to teach, but we know how to teach the students which used to sit in front of us in the classrooms uh, 15, 10 years ago. We, but we should find some new ways how to teach uh, new generation of students because uh, we can see that uh, in the educational process now, the main players of this educational process sometimes work in different regimes and uh, of course the the generations gap is uh, uh, just a trivial thing maybe but now i think we see a unique situation because uh, for centuries uh, parents adults teachers uh used to have the authority of knowledge and experience that they transferred to younger generations now i think uh, when we are speaking about uh, technological innovations about new gadgets younger generations are smarter than we are and very often they teach us how to use all these new technological innovations. And uh, I think for the first time in the history of the mankind, uh, the elder generations uh, lose the authority of knowledge. And uh, this is a, a, a unique situation. And um, well, thinking uh, how to teach them, I, I think we need a lot of information from related sciences, for example, from cognitive psychology and other sciences. If we're speaking about uh, teaching AIDS, uh, I think we, we have, uh, thanks to the development of technologies, we, we have a, a great array of uh, modern teaching aids. And I think that they helped us to overcome all the difficulties uh, that were connected with the coronavirus pandemic and uh, when uh, the universities, including engineering universities, had uh, to close their doors to students and to switch to distance uh, learning. And uh, a colleague of mine uh, from Russia, Professor Kubrushka, uh, gave a very good description of that situation uh, in which we found ourselves a year <laughs> ago. He compared us with uh, people in the middle of the river. Some of us were good swimmers, some of us were beginners, some of us were afraid to wait our feet, but it was necessary to swim in order to survive. And uh, I think we we managed to, to survive in spite of all the difficulties. And uh, the pandemic gave uh, 
created the conditions of a large-scale natural experiment. And uh, I think many educators didn't lose this chance and uh, took up a lot of experiments uh, to check up the effectiveness of many teaching aids. But at the same time, uh, the pandemic showed that uh, we need uh, new uh, teachers' professional development courses because some of us were not prepared for the usage of the variety of modern teaching aids. Uh, speaking about technologies and methods and answering the question how to teach, I think we, we have a great variety of methods. But in spite of uh, this great variety of methods, which are really good and effective, we can see that very often the outcomes of learning are uh, below our expectations. Even some educators uh, began speaking about educational failure and the necessity to research it as a um, phenomenon. And uh, the question <clears throat> is which method to choose in this or that situation. And of course, again, we need data from related sciences and we need uh, pedagogical experiments to, re to reveal comparative eff efficiency or inadequacy of applied methods as well as uh, the audience we, we are trying to use them with. Um, and there are here at last, uh, engineering education system. So we are uh, designing an educational model and implement it in the engineering education system. I think engineering education system, as any educational system, is characterized by some conservatism or lag effect. And if we are speaking about the system of engineering education, I think uh, this conservatism is rooted in the necessity to maintain and deliver huge amounts of information gained in technical disciplines over the decades and sometimes over the centuries. And this conservatism is both negative and positive. On the positive, it just uh, uh, gives the uh, opportunity uh, to the system to preserve uh, this, its community and integrity. And this is, of course, positive. But on the negative, uh, the conservatism of the system of engineering education is a slow and lengthy time response to absorbing radically new, radically new uh, things. And um, this is my ideas uh, about the main contradiction of uh, education 4.0. I think the main contradiction is between the rapid radical changes in the industry and in the profession of engineers, on the one hand, and certain conservatism of the engineering education system that results in slow response to these changes. And uh, we can say that uh, these contradictions and the factors uh, where we, we, I was speaking about constantly changing social demand, the necessity to forecast it, the shortage time for adjusting engineering education system, the generations gap, and so on and so forth. 
these men, this man contradiction and these factors make this search for the basic answers uh, more challenging than ever before. And uh, in order to receive uh, answers to these questions, we need uh, a contact with uh, industry, close contact with industry. We need data from related sciences. We need pedagogical experiments. We need the exchange of the results. And uh, by the way, Iggy uh, contributes to this exchange of the results greatly uh, organizing um, annual international conferences, organizing webinars and so on. And of course, uh, the figure of a teacher um, who is the central figure of the educational process. Uh, we need the, the courses uh, of professional de uh, development of teachers. And uh, EGIP uh, has already prepared the fourth version of uh, EGIP prototype curriculum. So uh, now I think I have some time to say a few words about engineering pedagogy terminology and the project which was launched by Iggy. So uh, I have said that uh, the exchange of opinions is really important. Uh, it helps to save a, a lot of time and uh, we communicate, I mean, educators from different countries. Uh, and the English helps us to understand each other. But uh, more of, most of us, uh, we do not speak um, American English or uh, British English. Uh, the majority of us speak English as a means of international communication or global English. Uh, here on the slide, you can see a table uh, that is connected with the 20th uh, ICL uh, International Conference and the 46th EGIP International Conference. And you can, you can see that uh, about 80% uh, of speakers, 78.6 uh, to be exact, uh, they are speakers from the countries where English is a foreign language. And of course, it causes difficulties, uh, some misunderstandings. Sometimes we mispronounce some words. Some sometimes we use uh, not appropriate uh, words in this or that context. And of course, there are some problems with the usage of engineering pedagogy terminology. Sometimes we use, and the, this problem is connected uh, with one fact. I think if we're speaking about construction, for example, the sphere of construction, uh, the terms belong, belong to one and the same terminology system. When we are speaking about uh, engineering pedagogy that is being developed in many countries, that, it, that uses different theories and follows different traditions, Engineering pedagogy terms belong to different terminology systems. And as a result, very often we use one and the same term to denote two notions, for example. Or vice versa, we use two terms to denote one and the same notion. On the screen now, you, you can see just uh, the name of the science we are speaking about today. And uh, so in uh, scientific articles, in, in the textbooks, in uh, presentations, we use one, two, three, four, five, six, six uh, terms uh, to, to denote just uh, this, this science. And that's why, uh, EGIP launched the project uh, of compiling, which is aimed at compiling EGIP 
multilingual glossary, we um, selected the terms in English and this glossary, the most prominent terms in English, and this glossary has uh, a term in English, the transcription of the term, the definition of the term in English, and we have a dream that one day all these terms will be translated into various languages uh, of the countries where Egypt has its national sections. And uh, I, I would like to ask everybody uh, who is just uh, is present at this webinar to send me uh, just the terms of engineering pedagogy you have some problems with and uh, I can assure you that these terms will be included in Egypt multilingual glossary. So um, now you can see the contacts of um, International Society for Engineering Pedagogy and uh, you uh, can see the email address of uh, IGI president, Professor uh, Hannah Horch, and uh, you can see the address of the general secretary of IGI, Professor Michael Auer, and you can see my email address, it's uh, kafedra101, um, and um, you, you can send these uh, cases uh, connected with engineering pedagogy terminology to me, uh, putting in the subject line, Egypt multilingual glossary. And uh, I will just do my best to include all these cases in the, in the glossary. So uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Wonderful. And, that, that was very, very thought-provoking, and I'm sure lots of questions will come. Uh, you, yeah. did arrange, you did arrange for a couple of polls. Did you want me to share the polls with people? Did you have a... Yes, I have prepared them, and I have sent them to Aleki, and maybe it's just the time to do just... What, you uh, want to do it right now? You want me to run those polls very quickly, each one? Why don't I run the polls, okay? This is... Uh, the first one is, where are you from? So let me launch that. Very quickly, let's do it very quickly so we don't take up too much time. Where do you come from? Asia, the Americas, Africa, Europe, Australia. Let's get the reaction. <laughs> okay, I'll give you 40 seconds to finish the poll. Okay, we don't want to take up too much time. I know, I know many people have questions and comments. All right, good. Okay, I'm going to stop right here. And, and Professor uh, Krishna, is it possible yes. to take away my presentation? I, I would like to see all of you at last. <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> <you're seeing? laughs> All right. Okay. So I'm going to close the uh, uh, the the, uh, the, uh, the 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 poll, and the results are 61% is from Asia, 22% from the Americas, 7% from Africa, 9% from Europe, and 0% from Australia. Okay. Just for your information. So, and uh, the second poll, I will just quickly uh, do that also. Uh, in, is English a native language for you? Okay, so this question is, is English your native language, second or foreign language? It, so in first is native, second language, foreign language, other. Okay, let's hear you. Yeah, let's see what the results look like. And again, yeah, come on in quickly, quickly. I want I don't want to take up too much time on the poll. I just want to some general idea of where we are here. Okay, so again, uh, give you 10 more seconds and uh, view the results. Okay, come in, guys. Use your quick fingers, quick fingers, quick fingers there. Okay, okay, I'm going to close. And uh, the results are 8% uh, native language, English native language, 8% of the population. 8%. Mm -hmm. 8%. Yeah, 08. 8. 42% is the second language, 50% of foreign language, and 0% other. So, so that's pretty good. Okay. Yeah, so it's let pretty me... good. Yeah, and, and the fact that they're mostly from Asia and many of them are from India. Yeah, that for them, then, you know, second language. Yeah, that, that's right. So many people for whom English is the second language. Correct. So let's let's open this up for questions. I know there are a lot of people here wanting to ask questions. And uh, and, and let me see uh, 
any of our panelists are ready to do that. Uh, but one quick question before I ask a few other people here. In, in several of your slides, uh, uh, you had mentioned this uh, psychological training of faculty. I saw that word come up quite a bit, a couple of times. What, what did you mean by training the faculty psychologically? Oh, uh, I think I, I, I meant uh, EGIP uh, prototype curricula, curriculum, mm -hmm. and this curriculum includes not only um, the disciplines uh, uh, in pedagogy, but mm -hmm. in psychology as well, and uh, in communication as well. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Uh, so let's see. Uh, any uh, Hano? You want to do Hano and and Michael? You want to make some comments or Allah after that? No. Hano coming? No. At the moment, not. We wait for question. <laughs> Somebody says, can you say a few words about IGIP? So maybe you're the right person, Hano. That's one about of the what? Say something. A few words about IGIP. Egypt. Egypt. Say yeah. a few words about Egypt. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, in, in the 20th century, uh, IGIP just introduced uh, the so-called Inkpayed register. And this register includes the lists of educators who have uh, very high uh, pedagogical competences. And uh, the register uh, can give information to the universities all over the world. And uh, some uh, educators in many countries can apply for being included in the register and for applying for the title of INCPIED. INCPIED stands for International Engineering Educator. And in order to apply, it is necessary to have minimum one year of teaching experience. Uh, it is necessary to have a diploma of an engineer. And it is necessary just uh, to study uh, the course of uh, technical discipline teachers development, which is based on the EGIP uh, prototype curriculum. And now it is equal to 20 credit points. OK, uh, other questions? I mean, those are on the panel can unmute themselves and jump in whenever they want to. A uh, quick question from Vikram. Uh, says, what about universal human values in engineering education? Uni universal oh. human values, human values. In engineering human education. values. Yeah, uh, I think. Uh, it is, it, is, it is very important and uh, there are um, two ways, I think, which we see now in uh, just developing human values in the students. Uh, first of all, I think there are a number of uh, uh, humanities in, the, in engineering universities with, that pay special attention to it. But at the same time, I think uh, the curriculum of uh, technical disciplines include uh, this matter in, in, in their just uh, programs and courses. And uh, when designing a, a new project, it is necessary to think about ecology, about the influence of the project on the people living around and so on and so forth. I think it's a very good question and I think it is really important for engineers uh, uh, to overcome just purely technical approach to nature. And especially now when we are uh, speaking about the problems of climate changes, I think uh, these matters are more and more important. Okay. Uh, you mentioned something about CLIP mentality, CLIP, C-L-I-P, CLIP mentality. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Um, that means that uh, our students um, can't work, can't concentrate their attention for a long time. They just grasp only some, just small portions of it. And uh, they, um, 
it is necessary for for them um, just to to see some visual aids at the same time to grasp uh, the the idea and uh, we see that they concentrate for some time and they they can't work in the same regime mm -hmm. interesting uh, yeah i think that i think everybody will agree with you on that actually uh, a couple of questions about I, you know, egypt uh, how is is it possible to get the prototype curriculum of egypt and how to become a member of Egypt. That's Vincent is asking that, and Edison is asking that. How to become a uh, member of Egypt, and how what yeah. can you get the prototype curriculum? Maybe we shall ask uh, Professor Auer to, to, to give just uh, uh, yeah. information yeah. about membership in Egypt. And we shall ask uh, Hannah Horch uh, to speak about just the fourth variant of the prototype curriculum because he is the person who developed this fourth variant. Hanno, you can unmute yourself. I see that Michael might have left us, Michael Auer. Uh -huh. Hanno, you can unmute yourself and, uh, and maybe answer both questions. Yeah, yeah I, I, I do, I do. The answer to the question uh, about the membership is easy. Uh, if you would like to become a member of iChip, you have to go to our website, it is iChip.org. And then you have different pull down menu, menus, and one of the pull down menus leads you to the membership of iChip. It's very easy. And uh, if not easy for you, then please send us uh, your email. We give you an answer, an answer to your question immediately. The second question is uh, maybe easy, maybe not easy, because I remember all of the participants, they also joined the last webinar from uh, from uh, uh, from the iChip and of course uh, you have organized it, Krishna. That was a a webinar about the new prototype curriculum, and it was yeah. introduced the main structure of this prototype cu curriculum. Maybe it should be a good idea. We can give again in a, a webinar details about this pro prototype curriculum because. In my opinion, but I'm one of the author of this prototype curriculum. Uh, in my opinion, we have widened the view on engineering pedagogy, especially on the different target groups. The first one, the second, the second point is we also tried to find out which different theories, especially also in the in the psychology, we have to use when we would like to meet in education the needs and demands of the labor market. And this is the third one and the last one. The relationship to the labor market is one of the most important main uh, characteristics of this new prototype curriculum. Okay, great. Uh, more, I, would, I don't want to go in, in detail. Uh, it's need too much time. <laughs> great. Uh, question from Chandan. Uh, this is about the teaching profession. Uh, maybe the teaching profession is not attractive enough for the young generation. Uh, and that is also affecting the pedagogy. Oh, uh, will, will you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah, the question is this. Uh, the teaching profession may not be attracting uh, uh, really good people and therefore pedagogy is becoming a problem. Because the teaching profession, the people coming to teaching do not have the interest or the passion to improve the pedagogy. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, no, I, 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 I think that if we are speaking about just uh, educators in engineering universities, mm -hmm. uh, I think um, now engineers have a lot of uh, opportunities to work in this in industry, and mm -hmm. I think only those. Uh, who are really interested in research and teaching, just try to find a job in universities. Mm -hmm. And uh, But at the same time, it is very difficult to combine research and teaching. Uh, that is really very, very, very difficult because sometimes uh, people just spend uh, too much time uh, on research and uh, they do not have enough time for just um, uh, 
making their teaching better. That's that's the problem, I think. Okay. Uh, on one, one more question, and then we'll get back to Hans and uh, uh, to wrap it up. Uh, the question about sustainability. What do you think about the role of sustainability in engineering education? Teaching sustainability. Well, yeah, I think you mentioned climate change and those kinds of issues. So do you, you see a role for sustainability, climate change in, edu in engineering education? That not clear, maybe. Is it a question to to hands? Yeah. No, mm -hmm. no. I think it's for you. It's for you. It's for you. Now, the role of sustainability in engineering education. Yeah, I I think it 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 is really it is really important, and uh, I I think the problems of sustainability are closely connected with. Uh, the problems of uh, climate change and other problems, and I think uh, the uh, the organization of the United Nations just uh, pays special attention to the uh, problems of sustainability. Uh, I work in um, Moscow Automobile and Road Construction uh, University, and sustainability of city transport is also important and of course it is necessary to pay attention to it and again we are coming to this conflict between a limited number of hours and uh, the um, habits skills and competencies that have to be developed mm -hmm. i think that's that's a major conflict right there in terms of yeah. knowledge versus New things, new things. Hans, back to you. You can wrap it up Thank for you. today. Thank you very, very much, Krishna. My dear friends and colleagues in all the different countries joining us, this is a very historical moment that we're together today. I just want to share that with you because since nine, in about 13 years ago, Professor Tatiana uh, was a very, very much uh, helped and participated thoughtfully in the formation in Paris of the Global Engineering Deans Council, the GEDC, that uh, many of several of us that here that are here today participated. She was there with us, and that organization, working very closely with leadership of engineering, engineering education throughout the world, has has it continues to grow. And she was a key uh, leader in and motivating uh, us in the formation of this organization and so it's it's just after quite some years i've not had the chance to to see her in person and for her to give this presentation and the fact that we are connected not only with egypt which is an important member of the ifes global community uh, but also with a russian woman leader that is fundamental and i want to plant the seeds tatiana uh, to Really, I'm very interested for us to explore more relationship with your peers in Russia. And you're an important country personally and professionally. And I just want to plant that, that idea and ask for your assistance. I'd like to identify other speakers of your very special, complex, uh, impressive society. Because I just wanted to mention to that. The other thing uh, I'm very, very happy is that Tatiana, Professor Tatiana, contributed to our very successful series of a book or a series of books called Rising to the Top, written by women engineering leaders throughout the world. And she's one of the authors, the co-authors that contributed to the second edition. And, and I'm just very, very grateful. As a matter of fact, we currently have a special discount for those interested uh, to connect, and we can certainly work with you on that. And also just to, particularly since we have several friends from other parts of the world, we are writing currently with awesome women leaders, uh, our third and fourth editions focusing on India and focusing on Africa. So I'm, I'm very, very pleased uh, to, 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 to mention that to you. Finally, and certainly not, not, not least, as I'm working very closely with my Egypt friends, Professor Hanno, Professor Michael Auer, in terms of the GDC Industry Forum in Dresden, Germany. Uh, this September it will be a hybrid virtual uh, conference, and I want to plant the seed. I hope to see in person, hopefully, uh, many of you 
in Dresden, Germany uh, in September, and then certainly our global IFES GDC WEAF conference in Madrid, Spain in November. And this is, we are very, very committed to engage our new generation of students in that conference, besides the professors, besides the corporate colleagues and the deans per se, and, and, and your insights into the thinking of the new generation that you mentioned in terms of your presentation, I found brilliant and so relevant and important. And I hope we will continue to, to, to focus on that particular on, on that critical session uh, topic. So, uh, Professor Tatiana, it's a pleasure, a privilege. I'm just very, very happy to see you and thank you for, for joining us today. All the very, very best. And above all, all of you, Please stay safe in this very difficult time that's impacting all of us throughout the world. Peace be with you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Professor, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And, and thank you, Dr. Tatiana. Very, very, very insightful presentation. Let me emphasize that. Very, very insightful. I learned a lot from it. So thank you so much. And I'm sure many of all thank the you. audience have learned a lot from it. So be happy, be safe, be healthy, everybody, and take care. Take care. Right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank Thank you. you.